Um, yeah, this, this conference is uh, kind of different. We, uh, I've been to conferences where uh, there's a lot of art and educational materials, but very rarely how Christians should think about it. You know, there's a lot of techniques and things like that. But I've been a little bit disappointed along the way at some of these conferences, and I, I hope that this will uh, be something that you would all share with others. When we first started the whole idea about a, a year ago, a little over a year ago, we put out uh, some information. And I was very surprised to get an email. Uh, actually, it was a, uh, yeah, it was an email uh, through a website I had from someone in India. And I thought, this, this is a joke or something. <laughs> so after a couple of weeks, kept writing to me about the art conference. And I said, you, you're for real. And so how did you find out? And he just was perusing the website. I didn't tell any of you. So I wanted to, and he found this old, it's still up, but this old website I had, Bezalel Art Project, maybe some of you have heard of it. And on that, I posted some little blip about, we're thinking of having an art conference and stuff. And I got this <coughs> email from India, and it did turn out to be real. And he was so excited about this, he wrote a letter and sent me a picture. He couldn't make it, he said. <laughs> he wanted to, but he couldn't make it. His name is Ravi Teja Depangi. I'm sure I messed that up. And, um, okay, so what do I do? <laughs> Want to put his picture up? <laughs> okay. He wanted to send me a picture that he made, and he wanted to share it with you. And I'm just going to read what he said about the picture because... Oh. <laughs> Can somebody get the middle, uh, Christian, would you get that middle light there? Oh, Christian's here, okay. <laughs> and I'll read you what goes with the picture. There it is. He said, this work of art, and I, I'm just going to read exactly how he wrote because, sorry, this work of art which I inspired by Matthew Gospel 25 chapter, <laughs> The ten virgins are prepared for heaven, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom, and five of them were wise and five were foolish. In this painting, the two girls are wise virgins and the another knives um, and candles symbolize the five foolish virgins. This is the painting concept I inspired from Bible verse and our almighty God has given this idea to do painting. From my side, I am praising God our God was strengthened me a lot, and also I am very happy to share this wonderful thing with you. So I told him I would do that. Thank you regarding Ravi Teja Depangi. And I just thought, I just wanted to make sure I fulfilled that little promise. And I also thought it was so inspiring. Maybe he'll be here next time we do it. <laughs> okay, you could put that on. There we go. Okay, so what is art? Three simple words and three simple letters that get so confusing. Generally, art may not mean very much to most people. In fact, it's usually the first thing that schools remove when there's not enough money. They have a budget problem because they don't, it's really not as important as other things like sports or whatever. <laughs> but art is more personal to most people. To some people, art may just simply mean fun a frivolous pastime, like bowling or something like that. Others, it may mean a way to release pressure or relax, <coughs> like a gardening or exercising. But still to others, it may be a kind of outlet for themselves or a way to express their feelings, like dealing with their emotions and things like that. Well, you know, actually art does have a lot to do with every one of those things. But there's a lot more reasons for that. But for a Christian, it's so much more. So much more than that. In our day, people tend to equate art with what they see out there in the sphere, in the culture. What and who are being highlighted and pushed on us? Usually in the art museums and, the, and on TV and, and the culture and magazines, 
the art world generally dictates what's art. And we tend to equate what we see out there with art, or at least the general populace. And that's understandable. There's a lot of good reasons for this. But I do want to make, I just want to, I want to show you some facts of where we've come in the modern art culture since about the late eight, 1800s. So I'm just going to click to the right, right? <laughs> OK. Um, actual displays in our art museums today, <coughs> that's what I want to show you, that this art world that we're in, and we've been in for quite a while, seems to think is worthy for public display, public consumption. There's different art genres. There's expressionism, there's abstract, and, and all that. So this is a little array of everything. OK. This guy, Edward Munch, it's called The Scream. Um, this was done in 1893. I have to tell you, this is uh, considered expressionism. And obviously, he's expressing his anger and his emotions. This, this artist, this guy, um, is actually in some Christian um, art books that I have personally gone through at different art, art, uh, different homeschool conventions. And I, I just, I asked them about it. That's another story, if I won't <laughs> Here we have an expre abstract expressionism. This was done in 1952. This is called the torso. This is another one the same, the <coughs> same woman made in 1982. It's 30 years later. She calls this one summer landscape. Does anyone see a landscape in that? OK, I thought. It was. OK, we all know this guy. Picasso, yeah, 1950s. He was a big uh, originator of Cubism. He is really uh, taught and I don't know if I should say emulated, but as a style of art and, and you know how to paint. This is called Still Life with Skull, Leaks, and a Pitcher. In 1996, an art gallery called the Gagosian Gallery in Soho, New York, displayed a giant ashtray full of real smoked cigarette butts and crushed empty packets. And it filled the middle of their exhibit space as part of their art display. 1999, you might have heard of the so-called artist that painted a so-called portrait in a cubism style of the Virgin Mary using elephant dung as part of the medium that he painted. Maya Giuliani at the time was so angry about this, he called it sick, and the city tried to sue the institution. You can't really sue them for expression, but he can, he was, they were trying to do all kinds of things to uh, stop it because of violations or regulations, things like that. It didn't work well. But the, but the public was very angry about it. And so I don't think it was there as long as they wanted it to be. But what's really horrible about that is after they took it down, it actually sold at an auction in England for four and a half million dollars. 1999, uh, there was another wonderful display in England. I don't know what it is about England. This was entitled Three Mounds. This was actually three piles of dirt. It was called Three Mounds. I think if any one of us would have wanted to do this, they would have said, you're crazy. But because it was Yoko Ono, they allowed it. She labeled, you see the signs under them, one is country A, one is country B, and one is country C. She took a lot of thought in this, I'm sure, because it means uh, it had something to do with anti-war sentiments, things like that. But there's other displays over the years that have been deemed as art and in the public venue. Uh, dead animals preserved in formaldehyde. A plastic crucifix was submerged in a glass tank in the artist's own urine. Depictions of artist's bedrooms the morning after. Depictions of actual murders, uh, 
pictures and, and uh, s stories from magazines put up on, on two-dimensional surfaces that are uh, like a collage. And these are just a few things that are considered to be art in our day. When I say our day, this has been going on since at least the 40s, 50s, and just progressively got, got worse. I know in the 70s there were a lot of this stuff, uh, but I'll talk more about that later. But more recently, in 2016, we have uh, this, this trio of work. It's, it's interesting, everything's untitled. You know, they don't know what to, what to call this. But the thing that's really bothersome to me is that these pictures are about 11 by 14, and the prices were ranging between $2,500 and $7,500, and people buy this. The latest auction news, tried to get as, as recent as possible, this was in July of this year, just this is a canvas with a woven piece of fabric on the bottom. It was auctioning, when I saw it, for $11,000, $11,000. The public exhibits like this do create a lot of outrage, but some of the museums are actually taxpayer funded, and that, that should create more anger. So with these kinds of public displays of worldly art, it's no wonder why so many people are turned off to art. This is what is being taught as acceptable or considerations for art. My question after seeing some of these things, and maybe yours hopefully, is where are the Christians in all of this? Where are they? And why? don't they have a say in this? Why aren't they speaking up? Do they even have an answer? Uh, are they teaching what God wants as far as art? And are they buying the worldly art? Are they helping this stuff? Or are they fighting against it? It's no wonder that people just can't relate to this anymore. It's just ridiculous. It's chaotic. Some of this work you saw before was just confusing and very bizarre, but more than any aesthetic reason, it's just useless. The only reason art or this kind of stuff exists now is shock treatment, to get a name, to get, and, and you know what happens. As crazy as people can be, other people talk about that person, and before you know it, they have a name. And whether good or bad, they still, people get to know who they are, and then all of a sudden they're popular. We are actually being taught how to think about art. We're, we're being re-educated to understand, in their view, the, wor the pagan view, what art is. I, I kind of like this uh, little cartoon. I don't know if you could read the bottom. It says, I know more about art than you do, so I'll tell you what to like. <laughs> this was actually in the very beginning of a secular art book I had, which I thought was odd because but, but this is a great cartoon because that's exactly what we're dealing with. People are telling us what to like. They're telling us what's good. They're telling from their minds and their understanding. So I ask again, what is art? As Christians, do we really know? I think that art is probably the last thing, if it's even taught through churches, but the last thing that Christians really talk about. It's one of those things where we've said the art world, that, that's, for the, that's for the world, you know, the artists, sh the Christians shouldn't have anything to do with that. Well, one, um, we, uh, we really, do we really know, the world is very often a sad and desperate and fast and hard place. I think the, one of the vital roles for a good artist is to help us to stop for a minute and breathe and to look and to help remind people that there is still beauty out there. There's beauty seen even in the smallest humble, the most humble things, even in simple shapes and colors, to offer some kind of calm or peace in the midst of a, of a world of chaos. A good artist can bring hope and a reminder of something better. A good artist can help 
people dream and imagine that th things they can't see with their own eyes. Sometimes we get so polluted what's out there that we really get desperate and it all looks so hopeless. Do you remember the very famous American artist, Norman Rockwell? Well, let me just tell you a real quick story about him. In the 70s, when most of this other stuff you saw was going on, that's when um, the, the drip art came out. Everybody familiar with it? Because they pro promoted it so much. Well, you can have a five-year-old do that, but that's not. Uh, he had already been painting for years from the 40s on. and So this was about 30 years into his, his career. But he went through a little crisis because he was starting to think his work was not good. It wasn't meeting the standards of, the critics were all over him, complaining and telling him and the world that his wor work was very outdated and no good anymore. Well, in the 70s, he, someone, he, he, just, he finally decided to have, or was able to have, his own uh, art, show ex exhibition in the center of New York City at a private art, art uh, gallery at a gallery and um, before he even it even opened the critics in New York were very negative well after his art show every single piece of his was sold every single one the the public was so hungry for it at that time it told it th this picture here was, it's called Saying Grace. I love this picture. Everybody, so in 2013, a couple of years back, at Sotheby's Auction House in New York, this painting was sold as one of the highest priced paintings ever at an American auction house, $46 million. Yeah, so, but why? Why do you think someone bought this? Why, does, why do paintings like this stand the test of time? and cross fads and things like that. Well, I believe, because pictures like this d depict something really special, life. <laughs> this shows real people, and people can relate to that. It, it also shows a simplicity, even in the middle of a chaotic world. It brings people back to basics. There's a hope here, and obviously they can remember God as well. But even with this kind of a testimony to the love of such artwork, where people will pay that kind of money and, and just crave this kind of work, the weird and famous usually dominate the art scene. Even our schools, like I mentioned before, um, if they do have an art class, they usually refer to artists and paintings that are worldly and bizarre as a way for technique or or uh, usually they aim at this idea of expressing themselves. That's a big thing for, for art classes, for students. They, they seem to just want to grab that student's attention and let them go with it and be free so that they like the class, so they do their work. You, I don't know, I'm sure you've heard of this guy. This is Andy Warhol. He had a quote of what art is. He said, art is whatever you can get away with. <laughs> this painting uh, is, was 1968. It was a collage of green, it's called Green Burning Car. It sold at an auction for $71 million in 2007. He died from complications with a gallbladder operation after he was shot at a, at a party he attended. He took speed every day, and he didn't eat for almost a month before he was hospitalized. He died at 59 years old. This, this picture, it's just called number 21. This was done by Jackson Pollock. He was the, he was the one with the drip paintings. Basically all it is is a crayon some kind of colored pencil sketch on a, on a piece of, it looks like some sort of uh, uh, rough art paper. But every, he wrote about art, this is his definition, painting is self-discovery. Every good artist paints what he is. 
<laughs> so I thought this was kind of good. Most know him for the drip paintings, but he was absorbed into drinking. He had a very bad alcoholic problem. He sought professional help for alcoholism and depression. He was involved in mysticism and with many women. He died in a single car crash with his girlfriend, even though he was technically married at the time. He was 44 years old. Picasso once said, good artists copy, great artists steal. Just to give you a little background on Picasso, he was a devout communist and, on, and he was honored with two Lenin Peace Prizes. He was an incorrigible womanizer, married once for nine years and later at 79 years old he was married for the second time but his wife on the second, the second wife committed suicide. He had four children from different women. He died with no relationship to them whatsoever. He was 91. God gave him a lot of chances, but I guess he didn't. I've seen a lot of Christian books about art. And as I personally flip through the curricula at these conferences, I was very, I'm very disappointed. For young children, elementary age, they highlight artists mainly because, as I mentioned before, their techniques, the self-expression, and the fun of it. What they should be teaching, especially in a Christian curriculum, curricula, is that art is a powerful tool. There's a message to be uh, given and, and received, and it should be handled very wisely. The good lives of the artists and what the legacy they leave should be talked about and of course their faithfulness to God. All these artists that have these problems in their lives and as the Bible says out of the heart the mouth out of the heart the mouth speaks so this is what comes out of their heart there's problems there and again like I said art is an expressionist uh, expression tool but to put this out and make the kind of money, it's a mockery of the art that God intended. And I am not opposed to teaching kids about all artists and all types. I, I'm not that way at all. But I think that students need to first learn from the best of the best. And I think they need to know the why behind the art and the difference between good and bad art, as well as the different techniques that are used. So if they learn the good, if they learn first, to be rooted in the good things, then they're ready to deal and take on the worldly things. So why do the weird and famous continue to dominate and push the news and the, and the movies? Well, one reason I believe is because Christians in general have dropped the ball. They've given up. You hear things like, the, the art world isn't God's world. That belongs to the weird. I've ha I had something, many people tell me, artists are weird. And, and, and you know what, artists definitely have a, free of spirit, <laughs> but they think outside of the box. They have to. Uh, but being an artist doesn't give us a license to sin. Maybe one big reason that artists taught to be so in sync with the art world is because people really do believe that the art world, the pagans of the world, know what they're talking about. They must know what real art is because they're in it all the time, right? They're absorbed in it. Maybe people who question that might think they'll look stupid or foolish if they don't agree with them or get with the program of the times. Well, I don't think they, the art world, for the most part, know at all what they're talking about regarding what art is. Some of them might, but I think they keep underground because they want to be accepted. That's a big thing. The reason I say this that I don't think they know what they're talking about, aside from God's word, which I want to share with you tonight, is because no two artists I have found in the art world have the same definition of art. There is no, I just read two definitions from the artists we've seen. So there's no, there's no one definition or belief about art that they can agree on. They all seem to make it up as they go or how they feel. Some secular definitions, just to throw it out there for you, is art, it, quote, art is the most intense mode of individualism that the world has ever known. 
another one is art enables us to find ourselves and lose ourselves at the same time. Darwin had a good one. Oh, this is a good one. Art is an activity even in the animal kingdom, springing from sexual desires and the propensity to play. And it's been said by some in books that I was just jotting them down as I was reading, so, quote, sunsets and roses are beautiful, but they are not art. Real art must be made on two-dimensional surfaces. A work of art must have been intended to be, wait, a work of art must be, I'm sorry, let me read this again. A work of art must have been intended to be, to be so by the artist. So therefore, if an artist says it's art, then it's art. The bottom line is, the definitions are so vast in the secular world from one person to another, which all means that without God, it's impossible to know the truth. Without God, there's no foundation. And that makes us all unstable. Without God, there's only chaos and confusion. And so it's no wonder that everybody's confused about art. In the document given to me in 2010, I saved the paper, but I don't have the reference, I'm sorry. There's a Christian writer who said, defining art is impossible in terms of non-Christian philosophy because defining anything is impossible if God does not exist. Without one belief, there is no one thing that unites us. God is that one thing. R.J. Rushduni, in his writing, in the Chalcedon Journal of Christian Reconstruction, volume 10, he pointed out this, quote, art is inescapably a religious activity because man, in all his activities, manifests his faith. He expresses his faith in his daily life in art, music, work, and play. In every sphere, there is no alternative to express that faith but Two, one is theonomy, which is God's way, God's law, the way he thinks, or autonomy, which is your own law or man's law. There's no middle ground, and I think that really says it. I, too, was raised with a lot of confusion in art. I actually went to college to learn more about it. Fortunately, it wasn't the fine arts. It was graphic arts. But later in my life, after my conversion, I wondered about my training in the arts. Was there any importance to it? What was its purpose? I wanted to believe that it meant something. But like so many other people, I was raised with that idea for the most part that it was all about myself, that if I liked it, just do it. So as years went by, during, during the years I was educating my, my own kids, I found myself actually using art techniques and ideas to help teach them. And I also taught them some basic art skills but as I was using these art ideas and visuals, I discovered some very interesting things. Drawing something, whatever it was, usually caused my, my children to focus and notice the world around them. And so that was brought actually in their studies. It also helped to calm them down, which is great for you moms who want to teach your kids. Give them a little artwork, they love it. It helped them to relax. They actually really enjoyed it. So I didn't have to force them to do an art lesson. And even with their other studies, whenever their, that art angle was used, they were very encouraged to do their work. So I started to wonder if there was more to this creativity thing than I was raised, than that reputation of frivolous pastime. So as I matured in my own Bible studies, I realized more that uh, it, from when I was first uh, a Christian, I realized more of how God owns everything. And this prompted questions in my own mind. Doesn't he also own art? Why was that given to the world? So the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. It seems easy for Christians to accept that God owns many things like science, history, but when it came to art, it's such a polluted area that it's hard to understand. One of the daily exercises I did with, with my kids when they were, uh, when I was teaching them was 
for their penmanship, I had them write the Bible. So every day for about 15 minutes, they would sit down and they would write the Bible word for word from where they left off the day before. It was a great exercise. I knew finally if they ever finished it, they'd read the whole Bible. We could talk about it. This happened while I was making breakfast so they could be quiet for a while. And, and it also helped their penmanship and so it was great. But I thought to myself, if I'm gonna have them do it, I need to do it myself. Because that's just how I think. So during those years, I also did it. So I came across some Christian art curricula while I was raising them that started to prompt my thinking about what the Bible says about art. It, it didn't go into it too deeply, but it at least linked God with, with beauty, that, those kinds of things. So as I wrote down in my notebook, my Bible writing, whenever I could, I decided at one time to try and search, what does the Bible say about art? So being married to a pastor, I thought this would be really easy. I'll just ask him, you know? And <laughs> I thought I'd take the easy way out. So I, I remember, you don't remember this. I asked him once, I said, does, does God say anything in the Bible about art? So being the great teacher and motivator he is, he said, look it up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I did. So I looked up the word art, right? That's where you start on your on your phone concordance, and guess what I saw? I saw it was used 452 times in the Bible. So I said, how did I miss this? So, so I looked up the first reference, Genesis 3, 9, and the Lord God called Adam and said, where art thou? <laughs> <laughs> Good old King James Version, right? So I said, oh no, so I knew this wasn't gonna be easy, so I, so, so, I couldn't start looking up 452 verses, so I prayed, and I kept writing my Bible. And I'll tell you, you should all write your Bibles down, because one day as I was writing down the Bible, I came across this verse in Exodus. Let me just... And this is where Moses is being instructed by God all the details concerning the building of the altar and the religious ceremonial components and so on. And thou shalt make it, an, talking about olive oil, a holy, an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. It shall be an holy ointment. Okay, a holy oil. So I was so excited. You don't know, I was so excited. So I immediately looked up this word, art. Now bear with me, you might need your notebooks for this. So, um, so th I, I looked up this word used in this phrase in the concordance and so that there was actually another verse. It was only 10, 10 verses later, and thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. So I finally had something to go on. So I looked up the Hebrew word for this translated word, art, and this is what I discovered. Okay, this was the definition. It's called, it's pronounced ma'ase, ma'ase. The definition, an action, good or bad, generally a transaction, abstractly, activ activity, by implication of product, specifically a poem or generally property. Now, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but we do have one at the New Geneva Christian Leadership Academy, and I call and I went over this with him and said, am I stretching this? Because I just got so excited, but he said, no. He said, that's absolutely right. Let me go, let me continue. But some things did, even though I'm not a scholar at this, but some things did jump out at me at the onset when I read this. So let me just share that with you. And I'm just, I'm just so grateful to God to be able to share with you and you can f do further study, hopefully. Okay, first what we see, it's a type of action that can be either good or bad. This means that there's got to be some sort of judgment or discernment here because we have to relate whether it's good or bad, some kind of action. The next thing in the, ver in the definition I saw was this word that popped out, transaction. This was interesting to me because it infers some kind of give and take a kind of understanding between people, a deal or an interaction. It certainly gives 
the idea uh, that art is not isolated. It's not just about you. There is an interaction. It assumes some kind of relationship with others. It's not all about self. The other uh, thoughts within this def definition tell us that art transactions can be either an abstract kind of activity with regard to art, this might mean something you can't hold in your hand, maybe music or some sort of philosophy or, or dream or thought like that. Or it also, uh, the transactions can be more substantial, like an actual product or property, something that someone can hold, like a piece of artwork. So in general, these initial thoughts on this word, ma'ase, started to give a clearer direction for the ideas associ associated with this word art. Now, I looked up in other translations, and they didn't have in the King James art of the apothecary. They would use a different word like work. But it appears that art doesn't simply mean, based on just we s what we see here, that it's just anything we want. According to this organic definition, art doesn't seem to have anything to do with work that is flippant or haphazard or exclusively personal. Rather, the definition involves a judgment between good, and good or bad. It's not isolated, but rather it's an interaction. As it's said it's in here, it's a transaction. Also, it can be something abstract or specific, like a property. Another way we can glean a clearer image about a word is to see how the word is used in the Bible. So the word ma'ase is not only is not translated as art all the time, obviously, in, 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 as we saw in these two verses, but it's actually translated 221 times in the Bible as different words. Here are some of the words we have, of course, art, work, works, workmanship, handiwork, deeds, do, doings, and, and things of that nature, occupation, labors, wrought, baked meats, acts, business, possessions, made, making, offered, operation, well set. And I had to look up well set. That was interesting. It had to do with hair. <laughs> it did. It's in Isaiah 324 if you want to look at that. But it had to do with beautifying or something like that. So the mostly, the mostly translated of all these words is no doubt, though, the word work or workmanship or some form of that. This certainly leans away, though, from the idea that art is merely used for pleasure. The word is used in all these different forms, always associated with artistry or crafts, such as needlework, brass uh, cutting, uh, weaving, breastplates, engraving, masonry, bricklaying, apothecary, of course, the tables of stone. When God well, Moses got the tables of stone, this was uh, associated with this word of art. Uh, the veil at the tabernacle, the anointing oil, the altar, the gold plates, the robes that the priests wore. It's used in association with so many other things. Some verses using the other translated words that we mentioned, it could be for good or bad, in the tabernacle, in the wilderness, and Exodus 28, 15, and thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. After the work of the ephod, thou shalt make it good. Uh, th thou shalt make it of gold, of blue, and purple, and scarlet. When the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, Exodus 5, 13, and the taskmasters hasted them, saying, fulfill your works, ma'ase, and your daily tasks, as when there was straw. Uh, concerning work done with wicked intent, it was also used. Exodus 23, 24, thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but thou shalt utterly overthrow them and quite break down their image. I just thought this is what we should do now. This is a good one to use now in our day, break it down. Okay, so this word ma'ase also refers to the work of God himself. Exodus 32, 16, the tables were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. Psalm 92, 5, O Lord, how great are thy works and thy thoughts are very deep. 
And Psalm 103, 22, bless the Lord all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Noah Webster has a really, I thought, a very good definition in his original di dictionary in 1829. If you ever get a chance to look it up, it's really good. I think he uses, and he has used a lot of his definitions from his Christian understanding. He elaborates art with three main descriptions. He actually gives three different descriptions. So, the modification of things by human skill to answer a pur purpose intended. This definition, this portion of the definition incorporates that idea of transaction again. You're doing it for a purpose, to answer a purpose. Another definition he uses is skill dexterity or the power of performing certain actions acquired by experience, study, or observation as a man has the art of managing a business. This definition suggests careful skill or workmanship and thought to achieve a good product. And this one I really like, a system of rules serving to facilitate the performance of certain actions, as in the art of engraving. Most people don't asso associate art with any kind of rules. But considering the art of the apothecary or uh, any kind of good art or craft or task, we can see uh, that meaningful that something meaningful and useful, there has to be some kind of orderly rules and a process to be followed. So if you get a chance to look at that, it goes into different kinds of art in, in his dictionary too, but it's not only associated with the work itself, but art is always associated with the artist that does the products like you saw Andy Warhol, Picasso, and Pollock. Okay, there's an, an, an example of an artist or an art director in the Bible, which I want to highlight to you today. In Exodus 31, 2 to 5, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones, to set them and in carving of timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. Bezalel was appointed by God to oversee all the building and beautifying of the tabernacle in the wilderness. His job was to oversee everything, all the creative tasks, the visuals as well as the building itself. In the first two verses of this paragraph, we could glean a lot of the faithfulness an artist should possess. This is what is pleasing to God. I have called is number one. When a person is called of God, he's not concerned firstly about himself. When God calls someone, he, God, has a specific plan in mind. Bezalel wasn't chosen by others. He wasn't chosen by his peers in the world. It didn't matter to him what they thought. He had a mission to do. Oops, sorry. <laughs> okay. We're going to get to my artwork soon. Okay. Here we have, the next thing is he filled him with the Spirit of God. When someone is filled with the Spirit of God, he's filled with God himself. He has the mind of Christ. He thinks God's thoughts after him. And if a person is called by God and filled with his spirit, he becomes aware of a lot more deep things of life, many more things. He's more concerned with what God thinks rather than his own interests. He realizes that he has a higher calling. Earthly things not only won't matter to him, but they won't distract him. He's not going to be swayed because the art world says one thing and he may be doing another. The rest of the verse lists, lists the attributes of an artist. This was put into Bezalel to do good and right art for God. Now keep in mind these things can be used for good or evil depending on where they get these things from. So after being called of God, filled with his spirit, he receives these from God. Wisdom, which has to do with how they use or how they apply what they know or understand. Understanding, 
which is how one interprets the knowledge they get, how they understand it, how they think of it. Knowledge has to do with the data, the facts, the why behind what they understand. In other words, if, if you go through an experience, maybe you walk through a field and you just want to draw or paint something, that's knowledge that you've gained. The understanding is the why you would want to do that or how you interpret it. Someone may walk through a field of beautiful flowers and think, oh, this is boring. Obviously, they're not interpreting it well, so that understanding isn't from God. Workmanship has to do with the skill, the actual techniques and the hands-on ability. Um, and, and, and realize this, that even the pagans can possess a couple of these things. They could have great workmanship. They have some knowledge about a subject, but if they're not blessed with all of them, or know God, or be caring about godly things, it, in the end it doesn't matter. It's just, it could be very bad art. Now, I, I'm not opposed to, um, to good art made by people that aren't claiming to be Christians, but I'll get into that in a little while. I also want to put a footnote here for New Geneva <laughs> because I do have, I go through a lot of this a lot more deeply than it is here, but um, we do have a course called the Philosophy of the Visual Arts um, that could be taken correspondently. So anyway, all through the building of and beautifying of the tabernacle, um, we can glean some really great things about the kinds of people that worked on this. As I mentioned before, they had weavers, tapis, tapis, tapestry, um, sewers, woodworkers, and so on. And these people are referred in such words like those with willing hearts, quote unquote, those who had a mind to work, the wise-hearted or the wise-hearted and willing, those that are, quote, devoted and sacrificial hearts. These are the people that God calls and fills with his spirit because they are this way because he fills them with their spirit. So as I mentioned before, this can be these, some of these attributes can be used for good or evil, as in the original definition. Creative person does not know a creative person who does not know God can apply the knowledge or the wisdom of the world. He may understand and gain knowledge in all manner of wickedness rather than goodness, and he might still produce some fine work because he practices his skill. There are even times when an ungodly person doesn't even have to do good work. People still buy it, as we saw. Maybe he's being supported by the rich and famous financially to, to push onto us, the rest of us, to buy his stuff or to know, and I think you might, Michael might touch on some of that later on. <laughs> but sometimes in a non-Christian a non will actually produce something that's noteworthy. And in my opinion, I think it should be supported. Uh, John Calvin wrote about this. He had a quote anyway, and, he, and I, I'd like to read that to you. John Calvin said, Therefore, in reading profane authors, he was talking about writing, the admirable light of truth displayed in them should remind us that the human mind, however much fallen and perverted from its original integrity, is still adorned and invested with admirable gifts from its creator. If we reflect that the Spirit of God is the only fountain of truth, we will be careful, as we should avoid offering insults to him, not to reject or condemn truth wherever it appears. In despising the gifts, we insult the giver of the gifts." End quote. Okay, so another point I want to make is how art is a very, very powerful tool, and this is where my, my great art comes from. First, there's a couple of reasons for art and why it's so powerful. Everyone can understand visuals, right? Who doesn't know that a heart stands for love? Or maybe a triangle with a little rectangle might be a tree, or a simple stick figure like that is a person, okay? You can travel anywhere in the world if you can't speak the, the verbal language. You might get by on pictures simple pictures. It's Art is very universal. It, it eliminates many barriers and it transcends cultures even. 
Another reason why art is so powerful is because it touches on the emotions. It's a very, emotions are very, very powerful, both positive and negative emotions. You know, it can rile you up or it can soften your heart. Think about a movie you saw or, or music, or things like that. It, it stirs reaction, it gets you going, it's, it's, it's emotional. Because art is such a strong communicator and motivator, the artist has to be responsible. R remember about Bezalel being invoked with all the attributes and how responsible that is. A good rule of thumb in the Bible is this. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are, are of a good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. You know, um, honesty and truth can also be something that's disturbing. There may be an art, a piece of artwork you've seen or any kind of the arts that might be a, an irritating or upsetting thing, it, but it might be true. But I think that as Christians, it's important to try and give some hope in whatever. That is the whole idea. Don't leave someone destitute like that skull we saw in the crayon. So what does that mean? We, uh, there's nothing we could do about that. <laughs> you know, it's just, um, I just want to make a little footnote. I know um, in Michael Minkoff's book, which is over there, according to his excellent grace and greatness, he has a great chapter on this passage. And I would really uh, suggest everyone to read that. It's great. Okay, so we, we spoke a little about the definition of art and what faithful artists should possess. I want to just talk a little about why God even made creativity. Why art? Why is there? Why did God care about that? Does man really need art? Does man really need to live? Or let me rephrase that. Does man need colors or fragrances? or beautiful shapes and, and wonderful uh, things to see in order to live. We need bread and water, right? So what's the purpose of art? Why did he make it? I have a couple of reasons for that. There's a, actually a lot of reasons for creative trades and endeavors, but we'll, we'll learn the reasons from God because I don't want to make them up. Number one is to glorify God. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Is your art different from the world's? What are your reasons to create it, and why do you pursue a creative path? Are you only purely motivated? Is it, when I say money, it's kind of funny, there's so many starving artists, but maybe notoriety, do you do something crazy so people would notice you stand out in a crowd? We need to, we need to consider why we're doing it. Um, there's another reason why God, I think, made art or beauty, and it is, it, art can be a personal joy. It brings a lot of joy. Could you imagine a world without any kind of art, without anything beautiful or meditative, like just computers, no offense. <laughs> does God give up, does, does, how does God give us things simply to enjoy? You know, the first question in the Westminster Catechism, I know, what is the chief end of man, right? To love and to enjoy, to love God and to enjoy him forever. But in Psalm uh, 104, we have, he causes the grass to grow for the cattle and the herb for the service of man that he may bring forth food out of the earth and wine that makes glad the heart of man and oil to make his face shine and bread with, which strengthens his, his heart, man's heart. Um, by the way, that verse is on my painting out there about wine. But anyway, why did he do these things? It, it sounds to me like he just, he wants us to enjoy his blessings. He wants us to enjoy his, his beautiful world. In Ecclesiastes 5.18, it is good and comely for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that it takes under the sun all the days of his life, which God gives him for this is his but it is his portion. We as, as artists and creative people need to enjoy our work. There is, and to give that joy to others. That, that is an absolute great and perfect reason to do what we do. 
Another one here is the very next verse. Every man also to whom God has given riches and wealth and has given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. The gift of God is to enjoy your labor. Don't you think as an artist, if you enjoy your work, many people, they kind of feel guilty because they love doing their artwork. Has that ever come across to anyone? It's, it's not really work. It's just play because that's the mentality, the art the world has put into our minds and we need to forget that enjoy what you do it is a gift from god i believe that god also enjoys his creativity you see this this is a 1990 photo of the hubble spacecraft it's taken hundreds of thousands of miles out of space why did god do this nobody can see it <laughs> but he can see it right why does he create such things? Maybe it's just his own enjoyment, it's just a thought. Here's just another picture. I thought this was good because I think, uh, what is that, Star Wars? Not Star Wars, that other one. With, maybe they got the eye, you know, from here. But the, if you go on the Hubble spacecraft, these things are, what, this is God's design. I mean, it's incredible. I, uh, so for our own enjoyment and for, in, to, to let others enjoy. Another reason God made things is for beauty. Decorative purposes. It's not a sin to beautify things, just to beautify things. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron and thy brother for glory and for beauty. And he and in Chronicles, Second Chronicles, he garnished the house with precious stones for beauty. He could have left it boring and but he didn't. He wanted to do these things. Another verse in in Ezra. King Artaxerxes of Persia, he thanked God for allowing him to beautify the house. He said, blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, which put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. So just for beauty. So there's three, three reasons right now God, God made art. Another one, fourth one, is to reflect God's attributes. Who is he? Okay. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. More than anything else, creative things, they have to educate people. They have to teach about something wonderful. And in this case, of course, it's God and his attributes. Without even realizing it, the things that God has made such as the mountains, uh, uh, you know, tell us about God, such as uh, they reflect, you, you could look at mountains and right away think of strength, stability, size, and grandeur. That's a reflection of the artist, just like we talked earlier. Uh, the waves, the power, his voice, if you've ever stood by the ocean, you, can, you can't hear yourself talk because it's just, so incredible. Art always says something about the artist. This is actual photograph in California. I, it, it always amazed me all the colors and the flowers and I just could imagine the sense and the beauty. This all reflects the, the artist. And one final reason I think that God create, created images and creativity is because art, artists project and teach something we as Christians are called to teach and to educate. We have a duty to do. However, what, however you want to call it, evangelize, preach, declare, preach, witness, art is a tool. It's another way to spread the gospel. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth his handiwork, shows his handiwork. This word handiwork, ma'ase, ma'ase, the sky, the heavens are God's canvas. So when someone said earlier in one of those pagan art books, art is not the flowers and art has to be on a two-dimensional sur surface, they're very limited. He is not confined to our ideas of what art is. Um, and there's many people, sadly, that say, if you only make Christian artwork, you're being stifled because they really don't know what they're talking about. God is infinite. 
in verse 2 here, that's verse 1. In verse 2 we read, Day unto day utters speech, uttereth speech, and night unto night shows forth, shows knowledge. So the artwork that God has across the sky, across the whole uni universe, across the whole world, is saying something. This is what we have to do. Say something with our art. One word, this Hebrew word is translated as, this. it's just interesting, this he Hebrew word speech is also translated as promise. I thought that was kind of neat. And then the third verse here is there is no speech or language where there, the heavens and the uh, handiwork of God, where their voice is not heard. This, this also follows the idea what I mentioned earlier, how, God, uh, how artwork is universal. When people see a beautiful sky, they feel the same thing. There's a peace about it. There's a wonder. There's an awe. He glorifies himself. That's one reason that he has created art. He brought joy for beauty to reflect his attributes and to teach us. So all art, all of art tells a story. What kind of story does art do today? So one last point I'd like to mention about um, art. The term Christian art I don't think should even exist. <laughs> I don't know if you agree with me. There is no Christian art. There's only good art, but there's bad art. Images of any kind, the art, uh, images or any kind of artistic endeavor doesn't automatically become Christian art because there's a Bible story or because there's a halo in the picture or because you know there's a cross on a mountain somewhere. We have to remember that this is God's world. It's not the secular humanist world. It's not, but, but we feel like it's the other way around. We feel like it's the secular humanists and God's people are in that. Nuh-uh. It's God's universe, and they're in it, and the Christians have dropped the ball. So whenever a Christian produces a work of art, virtually any subject can be considered. The difference is that artist's faithfulness, how he will portray that subject. Will it be for good, or will it be for evil? I just want to close with this last verse. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. And so I want to leave you with that. Thank you.